Dirt Roads Discussion here at West Bethany Free Methodist Church in Leota, Kansas. I'm Pastor Chuck McLaughlin. With me is Pastor Amy Arafat. And today's question is very simple. How can you please God? How can you please God? Well, Amy, I know that we've been studying on this. And, you know, it's to when you first see, hear this question, I don't know about you, but the first time I heard the question, it seemed like, okay, this is too simplistic. This should be easy to do. Yeah. Yet we want to make sure that we're doing it biblically right. when we come up with these answers. So that's why you do this faith study and an understanding that uh, it's not just what you think you need to do to please God. And it could be over an abundance to what you can find in scripture or it right. could be lacking what you find in scripture. But the most important is looking at the scripture and seeing where God is expecting us to go with this and this idea. Now, the first thing I found was Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And it's very simple because it says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So to start with this pleasing concept, we have to have a faith. Am I yes. correct? So how do you feel about that? Where do we need to go from there, Amy? Um, I, I like, too, that it says he rewards those who earnestly seek him because one thing I tell people most often when they are unsure is ask him. Uh, I don't think that he would deny anyone who earnestly seeks him, not a God of their own making, but anyone who says, I really want to know who you are and what I need to do. And I think part of that is faith, faith that he will respond to that, Right. that right. there is a, a, a God who is active in creation and not only active in creation, but active in our lives and interested enough that if I earnestly seek him, right. he will respond. And maybe that's where we start is that definition of faith. When we say faith, that means that you have a belief that there yeah. is a God yes. and that he is there to, to justly keep you uh, on the direction or path that you need to be. Right. Uh, we're not saying faith like a hope. Right. Right. I just hope everything goes good. That's not the, what this is saying. The faith means it has to have a faith or believe in him. And that's why I think it ends with that earnestly seek him. Because uh, one, uh, if we look at this faith as more of a hope, then the questions we ask will be something. Uh, and we talked about this before, uh, manipulating our questions to right. get the answers we want. But when you come earnestly seeking him, it's totally different than don't you think then? I, I, I definitely agree. Uh, if we're looking at a definition of faith, they don't have Hebrews open, but since you do, I would do 11 verse 1. 11 verse 1. Now faith that. is confidence in what we hope for and assurance for what we do not see. Right. And and I think the key words there are confidence and insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's a knowledge. And as much as we say we don't, we, we put our faith in things every day. I'm afraid of bridges, but I put my faith in them because I still drive over them right. to get where I need to be. Um, it's it's a confidence and assurance that what this thing says it is, it really is. And I think it's the same with God. Who he says he is, he really is. He can yeah. be depended upon. I believe in that. And I hope for what he has promised because faith gives me confidence in it. Right, exactly. And, and the fact that we serve a God as as the Bible says, that is the same yesterday, today, and yeah. forever. So he's not like changing, right? ever changing. And, and our seeking is just, okay, let's figure out who God is today. Yeah. Because he is, uh, he's a solid foundation. Right. That will never change from what he expects and things in that nature. So, I mean, that gives us a good head a start, I guess. I guess a foundation, if you want to call yeah. it, on uh, understanding how can you please God? First, have a faith and belief in him, A, number one. Right. Uh, and to do that is the most important thing. Okay. And where do we go from there? What do you have, eh? Um, What I thought of first when I thought of pleasing God was uh, Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. It says, what can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? 
Know, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Uh, most translations say, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Um, and I think this is important because it's from the Old Testament when you did have that sacrificial system to atone for sins, but it makes the point that even in the Old Testament, without a heart that is transformed by God to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with him, those sacrifices don't mean anything. Right. Exactly. It's it's more than just throwing something on the pit right. and burn, right? Right. Uh, but it's our actions that need to be there. And I think it, and, and I love how you brought up Micah, because it does, it talks about, you know, the rightness, the mercy, and the walk humbly. I, I've thought even... I must be a Hebrews nut today, but Hebrews 13 also tells us a little bit of um, giving a sacrifice God wants. And, and he talks about it in verses 15 and 16, where it says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer, a God, offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others for which such sacrifices God is pleasing. So it's talking about certain things as well, where yours is right, mer uh, you know, uh, love mercy and walk humbly. Uh, we're talking about a sacrifice of praise, praising God, professing his name, uh, doing good and sharing with others, which is the most important part because that's what it says. And do not forget to do good and to share with others in verse 16. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Yeah. So when we're thinking about that, uh, how do we please God? We, we, we have to be on the right uh, path, right? Yes. Yours was Old Testament, mine was new, but we still see that same thing that we have to do good. We have to do what is right for every individual, right? Right. I uh, agree. Um, and again, thinking it's, it's weird that we both went with sacrifice, but different directions. I was looking at... Uh, Psalm 51 verses 16 through 17 says, you do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O right. God. Right. Um, and again, with it being Old Testament, I think it's most significant when they point out the importance of repentance with sacrifice. Right. It's, it's not just a matter of, of covering this sin, but having that idea of that sense of repellent to you, you don't want to repeat it. Right. I mean, uh, we're supposed to be Christ-like. Yeah. And and part of that is a lot of individuals say, well, once we get to the New Testament, the New Covenant, that, you know, Jesus uh, was the ultimate sacrifice and there are no other sacrifices needed. But see, I think the word sacrifice changed or evolved into right. how do we be like Christ? And if anything, if you look at, you know, Jesus's words, he ups the difficulty of the law. It's not just right. if you commit adultery, if you look at someone with the intent, exactly. you are guilty. Yeah. Not just if you murder someone, but if you have hate in your heart for someone. Uh, I think it ups the difficulty of keeping that law. And in the Old Testament, you sacrificed the, the best of what you had to cover that sin. In the New Testament, you sacrifice everything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All that you are is his. Yeah, um, your whole being. Right. right. You have something? Um, I was just thinking uh, in that about with sacrificing, sacrificing yourself, uh, sacrificing everything. In Romans 8, um, it says, verse 7, it says, the attitude that comes from selfishness is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law because it can't. People who are self-centered aren't able to please God, but you aren't self-centered. Instead, you are in the spirit if, in fact, God's spirit lives in you. Yep. Uh, and it continues on. And I think part of that sacrifice is the sacrifice of self. I am no longer my own. Right, right. I mean, even if you added that verse six before, the mind governed by the flesh is death. Yeah. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and mm -hmm. peace. 
And because of that, we can look at that and understand this is the sacrifice he's wanting. An ultimate sacrifice was Jesus, and we're not going to downplay that in any way because it right. gives us the ability to understand that we uh, need to be uh, a servant-minded individual uh, to say that uh, I humbly give myself. Yeah. And, and again, when we say about pleasing God, I think that's one thing that we got to make sure we're doing because when we submit ourselves to God, then uh, one, that's the first stage of right of doing good or being right. Right. But submitting also means to follow God in everything, in every way. Uh, and sometimes we, uh, we get off the beaten path with this, don't you think? Yeah, I agree. Uh, I'm going to go back to what uh, something you said in passing. You said about, you know, serving, about Jesus being a servant. And I think sometimes, too, in pleasing God, we spend too much time looking for some grand calling. Right. Just, just do. You don't need a calling to vacuum the church or exactly. to rock a baby yes. or to be kind to someone. Yeah. Or if you see something out of place to fix it, just walk humbly with your God and serve. Develop an attitude, a, a lifestyle of service. I think that sometimes, I mean, I hear a lot from a lot mm -hmm. of people. I don't know what my calling is. Well, until you know, just serve. The calling for everyone is serve. Do something. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and again, that goes back to our faith. And in God, that even when we lack uh, the gift to do what we uh, want to do, serve right. God no matter what, that He will fill in the cracks that needs to be. Exactly. You know. Yeah. Um, I was I was reading an article. Uh, it was written back in 2016 called "Overcoming the Times." Now they list seven uh, uh, things that are pleasing to God. Okay. Uh, some that we already covered, of course, faith being one. Uh, one is that ultimate giving the sacrifice, which was their number seven on the list. Uh, but uh, there's other things that came to mind. One was spiritually minded. And, and some of these will find, you'll yeah. probably are starting to think, well, well, well duh, why, why wouldn't we be spiritually minded? But that actually rolls into that Romans 8 that you just yeah, read. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, and because of that, we, we have to understand that what we think, how we act, need to be of God. Now, the only way to get spiritual minded is what? To be spirit controlled. Spirit controlled. Absolutely. And it makes us understand that that's, uh, that's what pleases God the most. It, now, he doesn't want robots. Let, let's yeah. just set, say that, right? He doesn't want us to just sit around and just uh, wait for his command to go forward, right, left, whatever. Yeah. That's not what he's saying. Uh, but he's saying the obedience is just becoming, as we just said, like Christ, that we understand the importance of what Jesus did when he was on this earth in human form. Uh, but also we, we uh, identify that he was divine. Uh, and because of that, we can learn from that and, yeah. and, and understand what pleases God the most. No, I agree. Uh, and I like that you said that because uh, one thing, you notice I, I've talked to recently to some people who are newer Christians and what they're surprised by is from the outside that looking in, they think that Christians are all the same, that there's yes. this perception that there's just this lock in step. But now that they themselves are spending time in classes and in life groups and, and in conversations with these people, they're seeing how different yeah. we all are. Uh, and it, it's even funny to me, like, myself since being saved how both unlike me and still like me i am exactly you know yeah. I'm, i often I, i've been challenged before about uh you know uh church is not being diverse and someone not having diversity but to your point what you just said diversity comes in different things yeah. it's not just race and it's not just gender right uh, diversity or age yeah. diversity is is what you bring to the table yeah. how you were raised things of that nature that a lot of people don't realize that uh, your church is diverse because of yes. this, right? No, I, I agree completely. And I think, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but I think we almost do a disservice to the gospel when we only look at diversity that way. When Galatians tells us there is no male nor female, there is exactly. no old or young, there is no Jew or Gentile. That kind of diversity doesn't matter at all 
in the kingdom of God. Right. If you want true diversity, we are who has it. We are who are being built as, as Peter says, into those living stones yeah. upon the cornerstones, who the parts of the body that work together. Yeah. Um, I think that the church, the universal church of God is where true diversity exists as it was intended to. Yeah. And how can we determine diversity based on, uh, you know, if you have that faith and belief in that commitment to the creator yeah. of all mankind, of all things living and, and breathing on this earth, to, to understand that the creator has created the diversity, not us. Right. Uh, so how, how would we limit it by defining it in, in by only certain aspects instead of understanding that God uh, provides the gifts and the skills right. to every individual in different ways, right? No, I, I agree. And if you're only looking at it that way, you could have two people who by the world standards are diverse, but are very similar, have similar thought patterns, similar talents, similar ways they grew up, right. similar ideas. Right. But two people who from the world standards are not diverse, but are wildly diverse in their interaction in God's kingdom. Exactly, yeah. I, I love that. And I don't know why we got off I, that beat. I don't hat. either. I was but, just going to say, I don't know where that came from. But yet, I, I think it's it's important that we look at this diversity. And spiritually minded is why we bring that diversity into a, uh, uh, if you want to call it, into a group uh, of of following God and pleasing Him no matter how diverse we are. Yes. Right? Um, yes. So, I uh, Beyond spiritual minded, the other one was fear of God. Uh, we've yeah. talked about this a little bit, but a fearing of God is important, I believe, uh, with an understanding that that doesn't mean be scared of him. Right. Uh, but the fear is more of a reverent fear to know that he is the one in charge and we are his servant. Right. Right. He he is the father. We are his child. Right. Concept. Uh, Psalms 147.11 comes to my mind where it says the, the Lord, the Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in it's in his unfailing love. And that's what we're trying to get that delightfulness of God, that pleasing of God. So he expects that reverence. Right. right, right? Exactly. Or respect, and, I guess. And I think, you know, even, even thinking of parents, we think of God as our father, like my, my mother to say that I'm afraid of her. I'm not, but, but I'm afraid of her. I remember when she beta was like, <laughs> Two years old, maybe I'm trying to get her in the car seat. And she's doing that thing where, she, like, you can't bend their legs for nothing, and I'm trying yep. to karate chop her and not break something important, and she won't go in. And I said a word that I, I I will not say now because my mom might be listening, but I would say in church because I do not think it is that bad. Um, but it was, I guess you could say, a replacement word. I am 25 years old and I am married, and my mother turned around and she hit me in the mouth and said, "You might as well just say it." I'm afraid of her. <laughs> And I think with God, it's the same. We should yep. know that there's a line. Absolutely. A reverence I have respect. a healthy respect. Yeah. La and I don't ladies and gentlemen, it. this is the woman that makes sure she wears a dress if she's ever out in front of the camera because mom My might, mama be, might be there. Yep, yep. Mom might be watching. So absolutely. That's the fear and respect that we yeah. have. Right. Yes. And I could go to her with anything. And I know that. And she's she's always got my back and, and I love her and I'm not afraid to approach her. But that day I learned that the line was a little further than I thought it was. And I readjusted. So yeah. and that's how we yeah. need to be with God. It, it, well, and this is how God acts uh, with us as well. I mean, we talk about a loving God and I've heard many people say, well, God loves me too much to to not forgive me or God loves me too much that he won't uh, accept me for who I am without right. repentance or change. Uh, but we also need to understand that God um, acts with discipline, right? Yeah. I, I think too, um, I didn't look it up, but it, it, it is in Hebrews, uh, maybe chapter 10, where it says that if you continue to sin after you have knowledge of that sacrifice, that you walk on the Son of God and treat the sacrifice as something that is not holy. Mm. Um, I think it's chapter 10. I can't find it. That's, that's... But 
Um, it, it makes uh, yes, it is. Uh, for this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifice repe repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped for being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all, would no longer have felt. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said. Uh, and this helps us understand that what we give God is important as much as understanding or recognizing those things that we do wrong and that we must not just ask God for forgiveness, but repent from it, right? Yeah, I agree. I found it. It is 10. It's verse 29. How okay. much worse punishment do you think is deserved by the person who walks all over God's son and who acts as if the blood of the covenant that made us holy is just ordinary blood and who would insult his spirit of grace? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it, I think that when we do that, we downplay the sacrifice that was made to buy us. Exactly. Um, I think of Isaiah 53, 10, you know, it says it was, uh, the Lord wanted to crush him. It's it. Some verses say it pleased the Lord to crush him. Uh, th this perfect servant, that is what we cost. Right. So, uh, I don't know who said it first. I've heard it many times that, you know, salvation is free, but it is not cheap. Exactly. And I think that, if you can look at so great a sacrifice and not feel the need to change anything about yourself, you should closely examine yourself and exactly. think about that, why. Exactly. That's the respect that yeah. we need to give God. Understand that we recognize what is right and wrong according to his ideas. I yes. mean, we just did a segment on morality with this idea and thought and, and have a conscience that uh, people feel that without God, uh, we can still have this moral yeah. uh, aptitude or, or, or aptitude. But but when we look at this, that means that once we know it's wrong through God's eyes, that we need to get it right. Uh, and to make sure that we don't keep falling back to it, right? Right. That's the respect and fear of it. Uh, uh, the others are plain and simple. I think you've already covered with... Uh, uh, even talking about love mercy. Yeah. Now, what do you mean? What do you think he means by love, uh, love mercy? Well, I think it's important to remember that mercy is something that is not deserved. And I know that before I was saved, I was much less inclined to love mercy. I may have thought I did, but I loved it for people I thought deserved it. Okay. I think once you get saved, you have a better understanding that no one deserves it. And so uh, you love it for everyone. I can't help think, um, I saw a, a video on YouTube once and I can't stop thinking about it. Um, it was a father's testimony. He had a chance to give a victim impact statement. Uh, the man on trial had raped and murdered his eight-year-old daughter. And what he did was forgive him and give him the gospel message uh, and he explained that there there are consequences for what we do when we are in sin that this man's consequences that he is probably going to remain in jail but he can be free in the only way that matters which is to accept right. salvation he explains that his consequence uh his daughter and uh his wife had gone to church he wouldn't go until his daughter died he said my consequence is my daughter never got to know me as the father i should be Right. Because she was gone before I came to know Jesus. But because I have received mercy, I want it for you. That is the kind of mercy that without God you can't give. Yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, it's it's that love uh, that we need to understand is, is totally different than what we can provide. It has to be that unconditional agape kind of love that only God has provided and has given example to time and time again that we can understand that we can have that mercy as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, even that, that illustration you just gave that story, it even goes back to even we said the discipline that exists, right? Yeah. Uh, lo and behold, we think of all the negative things that happen in our lives, but we don't recognize that a lot of times uh, the negatives is, is what has drawn the discipline from the yeah. negative. Right. Right. Uh, and it does hurt. It does hurt. But yet 
it's there to recognize that God knows best and that uh, he wants us to lean upon him more, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, we look at this in that love mercy and walking humbly is just obedience to God, is it not? Yeah. I mean, it's just walking in his faith and his commitment with obedience to him. I agree. Just and, the acknowledgement yeah. that I do not know best, he does. Yeah. I think of First Samuel. First Samuel, I think it's in chapter 15 where it says that uh, to obey is better than sacrifice. Yeah. I think it says. I think you're right. Uh, uh, and when we think of that, you know, we don't want to say that, wait a second, these guys are contradicting themselves. They're saying that sacrifice is so important. It is, but obedience is far more important than sacrifice. Obedience comes with sacrifice, does it not? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I would agree to that. But the... Um I think the caveat is in obedience, the sacrifice is the sacrifice God desires, not what we think we want to give. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and those are often very different. I was thinking, I don't know who said it originally. It's quoted by Elizabeth Elliot, but I don't think Elizabeth Elliot actually said it. But she said, uh, if my life is broken when given to Jesus, it may be because the pieces will feed a multitude when a loaf would only satisfy a little boy. So we have to look at things, I think, in humility as, as bigger than us. Right. Um, one of my favorite things when I was thinking about, do I, do I want to become a member of this church? And I was reading the book of Discipline early on. What caught my attention was the focus on a, a kingdom-minded people. Um, the understanding that we live here, but not for here. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and again, I... I I don't know, you probably have experienced people, especially the ones that get up in age, they come to a point that they feel, okay, I've done everything I can. Now I'm just going to sit here and wait until he takes me. Yeah. Uh, but yet when we think of walking humbly, uh, that's movement, that's action. No matter how old you are, or what you've gone through, or what you've already given him, it's humbly walking with him with that understanding that, you know, maybe my gifts or, or, or abilities change. Uh, through my life, through, you know, uh, uh, health and things of that nature. Right. But God still expects me to humbly give myself as as his own in obedience and sacrifice. No, I completely yeah. agree. My mom, she's going to be uh, 80 in April. And she said to me different times since I, I've been here in Kansas that especially since she lost my dad, she would think she considered him to have the, the stronger faith. And she would think to herself, why am I here? Like, there's nothing I can do. Uh, and she said once she changed from the why am I here to what can I do, she's amazed at the things she's been given to do. Exactly. She can't yeah. even leave the house that she is in, but we are still we are still connected, and he still expects us to contribute. Yeah, he and does. We contribute here until we are there. Yeah. and And, again, I guess... When I looked at this article, they gave seven things, but many of them could be blended together. Uh, as we talked, walked humbly, being obedient, but it also says do God's will, which isn't that being obedient, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. in a nutshell. I mean, but it does give scripture to that in Hebrews 13 again, where in verse 20 says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd and the sheep, equip you for everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Uh, again, what's pleasing to him, may he work through us those things. And, and part of that obedience is knowing that God's going to provide to you uh, what he expects, his will. For yeah. your life, right? How do you feel about that? Um, I, I, I like it. I like that it gave that verse because it speaks of the utter dependence we have on God to even do his will. Right. Um, because I don't think we can overemphasize enough how impossible all of this is without his help and his guidance uh, and his strength. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... You're exactly right. When I look at this question, how can you please God? We don't have enough strength uh, in our own being to do everything that God expects us to please him. Right. 
So we have to lean upon him. That's why you have obedience. That's why you have this reverence for him. That's why you, you continue to build your maturity into a spiritual, mindful person with your faith and your growth in that relationship. All things are wrapped around God. How do you please God? Uh, by just allowing him to take over and yeah. just follow the commands that he has. Uh, okay, so we're getting to the end of our time together today. Uh, Amy, do you have any last words? Um, I think my last word would be uh, just to remember that what pleases God isn't isn't often what we would expect. And to be in God's will, sometimes our life doesn't look like we would expect. I'm thinking about uh, Matthew 5. We have the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, mm -hmm. that list of those that, that God calls blessed. And it is almost in direct contrast to what someone who doesn't have God would refer to as, as blessed. Uh, blessed. Um, I like the New Living Translation version of it. Those who are poor and realize their need for him. Mm -hmm. Those who mourn, who are humble, hunger and thirst for justice, merciful, whose hearts are pure, work for peace. And then you have this, uh, those who are persecuted for doing right. Because we have this assumption that if we do right, it doesn't come with persecution. Right. Um, we have this assumption that persecution only comes um, from doing something that isn't isn't good or bad. Uh, but then you have verse 11, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be very happy about it. Be very glad. Um, so I think I would emphasize that the point of the question is how can you please God? Don't assume that's going to please people. Amen. Absolutely. I always think of that, uh, the phrase, given till it hurts, right? Yeah. Uh, and when you're pleasing God and not people, uh, a lot of hurt will come from that yeah. from other individuals. Maybe they think you're taking it too far or maybe they they think that you're creating this uh, this gimmick of holier than thou and, and things of that nature where yes. all you want to do is make sure that you're putting God first. Exactly. I think right? it, I think it's A.W. Telzer. He said something like, you know, you go to church once a week and no one cares. You, you follow him every day yeah. to see what people do. Absolutely. That's that's when people find you strange or or too much or too fanatical. Um, but I think that's the key. Remember, the goal is to please God. What pleases God does not please the world. Right. Absolutely. My final thought to this is, uh, and I alluded to this when we first started, was, you know, the, the best thing that we can, can do to please God is just follow Jesus' example. Yeah. Um, I think a scripture in Matthew as well, in 17, it's talking about the transfiguration, that point of uh, Jesus with his disciples, with a few of his disciples. And that verse five, uh, when he is there with Moses and Elijah and is yeah. uh, appeared beside him, we see in verse five, well, first four, Peter's first says, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking in the middle of Peter speaking, a bright cloud, a bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Yeah. And right there just gives me this example that we need to be Christ-like in everything. So this is God speaking of his son saying that he is so well pleased with his obedience and how he acted as, in human form and how he uh, continued to be faithful no matter what. And because of that, we can learn from that and put it in our lives. Um, and I think that's important. I think, uh, a lot of times, uh, I've been there. I, and, and I guess it, it, it's part of walking in humility because if you're Christ-like, 
this humbleness needs to be there as well, because if you don't think of it that way, then you don't think it's possible to be Christ-like. Yeah. Do, you, do you understand what I mean? Yes. If you really have this obedience with God and this uh, relationship with Him, then you think, how can I be Christ-like? There's no way. I've, I've messed up so much. I've sinned so many times. And this is a sinless man when he was on this earth. So how can I ever be like Him? Well, the only way to say that is because it's only through God's uh, wise mercy of uh, of giving us this opportunity through his death, but also to walk humbly in his shoes. Don't yeah. take it for granted. Uh, uh, a lot of TV evangelists have lost the hum the humbleness yeah. that is needed, right? So uh, with that being said, we come to the end of our time. Uh, I'm hoping you got something out of this today when you say, how can I please God? Uh, and more than anything, uh, can I just say that you just got to, you, you got to take time for God. Yeah. So if you want to please him, you know, being a parent, I know uh, you as well, being a parent, those times where it just felt like your child wasn't connecting with you, that it felt like you were being ignored or that you are not yeah. needed then, uh, you know, it hurts. Yeah, It hurts me as a parent. And I often think is it's the same as God. Uh, when we don't take time for him, we, when we don't acknowledge him and praise him for who he is, uh, I can just imagine him saying, I'm here, but you're not recognizing me. Yeah. It's, so uh, ag again, in Matthew, I think it's in Luke too. When you know when it talks about Jesus, how I long to gather you. Yes, absolutely, but you would not. absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we come to our end of our time. This is West Bethany Free Methodist Church in Leota, Kansas. I'm Pastor Chuck and Pastor Amy. We will come back next week, and the question we're going to look at it is simply, "What is heaven?" And see if we can get into detail on what God expects in scripture and biblical of what is heaven. Until then, I wish the best for you and I wish God continues to enlighten you and direct you in the ways and paths that he has for you. Until next time, we hope uh, you just stay close to God. Thank you.